get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm really excited. We have Ken Glickman, who's a highly sought after marketing consultant and business coach. He's given over, I couldn't believe this when I read this, Ken, 1,200 presentations and trainings on marketing, stress management, time management to such companies, which we've heard of GE, Federal Express, Rubbermaid, and there's a long list of others. He's been on CNN, Fox, ABC with Barbara Walters, and many more, and he co-created iPower, Time Management Magic, Stress Busters, and several others. Ken, thanks for joining me. A pleasure to be here. I mean, I just want to correct one thing. I, I yeah. co-created the the seminar. Uh, the program was developed by Marty Edelston, who maybe we'll talk about. We that. will talk about. Founder yeah. and publisher of Borden Reports. Amazing man. Yes, and it's interesting how you guys met, so we'll talk about that yes. too. And, yes. and talking about that, the fun fact, I have a couple of fun facts about you, which are very interesting. One, you're very into hypnosis and the subconscious mind. Yes. And... You're a fourth degree black belt, which leads us into Marty. But but for a second, talk about Ken. How'd you get into hypnosis in the, in the subconscious mind, and what do you do to practice those things? Okay, great question. And you know, I I was interested in the subconscious mind going back to high school. So it's been like fifty years that I've studied it and work with people with it. And hypnosis is a part of that, a way to communicate with the subconscious mind. But probably ninety percent of everything you do in life physically the habits you have your belief systems your your perceptions which govern what how you think what you say what you do are really directed from the subconscious mind involved in the subconscious level mm -hmm. so a lot of times if we want to change if you want to bring out real change in yeah. life really have to get down to the subconscious subliminal mind and make the changes there or nothing's really going to happen if we just try to do it in the conscious level yeah, and that's the most powerful thing because our upbringing and everything affects our subconscious mind. So, so what advice do you have for people trying to make real change? Because they probably fall back into those old patterns. Well, I mean, one of the things I'm working on very heavily now for the last several years has been the area of stress, particularly chronic stress. Yeah. And people don't realize how it affects, I mean, health-wise, we're talking about lower back pain and sleep disturbances, stomach disturbances, and, and diabetes and heart disease and stroke. And since chronic stress shuts down your immune system, it could lead to opportunities, infections, or even cancer. Right. But as a business person, besides that, and which is plenty, uh, right. it also affects your judgment, your emotional state, your energy, your ability to concentrate and focus and learn and memory. Uh, your communications with other people. Yeah. So on that level, it's really important if you're going to to operate at optimal level that you control that chronic stress, and you can do that. Yeah. That's why you're here. So tell That's, me. Yeah. yeah. So what do you tell people about controlling that stress? <laughs> well, you know, I need what you you lay it on me. I need this. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's 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 several approaches. One to understand the function of the autonomic nervous system because the autonomic system controls the stress response mm -hmm. and the relaxation response and certain things trigger that yeah. and when, for instance the sympathetic which is the stress response is activated you have things like increased respiration, increased heart rate uh, release of glucose for more energy uh, redirecting the blood from the uh, immune system and certain internal organs to the muscles and so so all those things take place that's wonderful yeah. that allows you to fight or flee much more quickly then once that's occurred the parasympathetic nervous system should kick in and return all that back to a state of uh, relaxation right. and rest uh, what happens though is for a lot of people that stress is no stressors no longer that tiger jumping out at you it's the tensions of business and things like that and, right. and dealing with people and the overwhelm so what happens is that stressor button 
stays pushed. Right. That is about chronic stress, release of cortisol, and that's where all those things happen. All those break that literally eats away your body. So, uh, you know, 80% of all doctor's visits are stress-related. Right. And so if you're suffering, again, from lower back pain, from tension, headaches, from indigest, yeah. trouble sleeping, all those kinds of things, very, it's very likely that stress is either the cause or it's a major contributor. But mm. you go to a doctor these days, you have a stomach problem, they give, give you a medication for your stomach. Lower back pain, medication for that, trouble sleeping, right. medication. And I have all the, the interactions with that. Right. If you deal with that functional stress, you can do it. And we do it in a lot of ways. First of yeah. all, how you think. The more you see in your life is threatening, the more you go, that stress button is going to be pushed. But we also have developed a system. When you talk about the mind-body connection, what's the connector? What connects the mind and body? One of the major connectors is your breathing. Mm. And if I were to say to you, if you monitor your breathing when you're really upset, yeah. you notice it's rapid and shallow. Yeah. If you were to monitor your breathing when you're very relaxed, it would be a diaphragmatic and slow. Yeah. So uh, the, the other side of that coin is if your emotions affect your breathing, your breathing can affect your emotional state. Yeah. So we, can, we do three things. Yeah. We clear the mind of negative thinking. By the way, negative thinking triggers the stress response. Yeah. So first thing we got to do is wherever you are at that moment, and we, we work at the moment. We don't say do something in the morning. We say when you feel the stress coming on or you're going to a mm, stress I like that. situation, yeah. just 60 to 180 seconds is all it takes. First, clear your mind. We teach you how to clear your mind. Turn off the alarm. Get your finger off that alarm button. Turn that stress response off. So the first you got to do is clear your mind. Then by br the proper breathing and some other things we do, we want to deactivate the stress response and activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Once the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, relaxation begins to take over. It could take right. a little, and that's automatic. And the last thing we have to do is we have to make sure when you're done with this, you don't return right away to those thoughts that's going to trigger the stress response again. If you do that, you've had a few minutes of relief, but we don't want just that. So you have, by memory, by association, this is critical, memory by association, you have within you now memories of certain wonderful times in your life. Yeah. And that's just not memories of places, sounds, and all that kind of stuff. It's the actual feelings you had then registered. So what we teach people to do very quickly is reach in there and recapture that feeling. So, example, you would feel like you did when you came back from great vacation. You would actually feel that. Hmm. So it's clear the mind of the negative stuff, activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So physiologically, you start bringing that relaxation, calming response, yeah. and then bring into your awareness, your actual being in the moment, those exact feelings you experience at that time. We're not saying just go back and remember them. We're saying mm -hmm. bring those feelings right into the present. Yeah. So if someone said, hey, you need to get away from vacation. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that real quickly. Right. So yeah. it's very powerful. That is powerful. I'm going to work backwards for a second, Ken, because we all need this. I need this, right? We all have a lot of stress and yeah. overwhelm, uh, whether it's business, family, or whatever it is. So the memory thing, so people should just go back and visualize, have some kind of memory in their, in their past that is that warm, fuzzy, amazing feeling. And the breathing part, the parasympathetic, I was watching a video on this the other day, actually, uh -huh. on the diaphragmatic breathing, and they broke yes. down exactly what you're saying, and yes. that there's a direct connection with the parasympathetic going to the diaphragm, so that deep diaphragmatic breaths will stimulate that relaxation, which I... You know, it makes perfect sense when someone lays it out like that. And then the clear the mind. So what is an example? How can someone, my mind's always going, how can I begin to get one step sure. closer to clearing sure. my mind? Let me jump back for a second. Go ahead. That diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah, yeah. What's even more damaging is most people have habitually developed unhealthy thoracic breathing as their default. Mm-hmm. So they're constantly stressing themselves out by virtue of their breathing. Yeah. 
where they're just sitting there doing nothing, yeah. they have they have that kind of breach. So we have to retrain people. It takes a little yeah. bit of time. But that is yeah. very, very powerful. Yeah. It sounds so simple, but it's so powerful. Is there a video online or something that you've done or that you recommend someone check out? I'll have something. I mean, I think the thing to remember, it's simple, but since you have a lifetime of habitual ineffective breathing. Yeah. And by the way, just real quick, habits work on the subliminal level because that's what a habit is. You do it without thinking. Right, right. So you have a habitual breathing uh, patterns yeah. that are very damaging and you're not going to just do it in 15 minutes though you can learn it and then you have to apply it and mm -hmm. by just doing that you're going to reduce your tension level mm -hmm. dramatically all the time yeah and so there are things available but i'm going to give people a phone number and they can call me <laughs> i will i will get them involved in that wow and, and those forms of medicine are you sure you want to give people your phone number ken you're a busy guy no. <laughs> this will be directed. Uh, oh, but gotcha. the, the thing is, meditations, tremendous meditations out there that teach you a form of breathing, which is very, very important. I mm -hmm. think what we differ from the meditations, again, meditation 20 minutes a morning, this, that, which is wonderful, but we want to give something pe people something at the moment. You're right. going into a meeting, you're getting stressed, take a minute. 180 seconds, sit down and calm and relax yourself. By the way, calm and relaxation is not inconsistent with focus to mind. Yeah. You can be very relaxed, very focused, and very capable of yeah. that. You know, yeah. terrific. So, what's the number? Give me the number. Okay. 917 <laughs> yeah. 306. 3098. 917 So, and uh, I've done a lot of beta with this program. I'm going to do probably another month of beta so I can get someone involved in the beta. And then we're, we're taking it out. Yeah. And we've had a lot of great results. And for myself, too. Um, you know, one interesting thing that we're working on, this is um, when we talk about, let's say we're going to work with you on the relaxation mode, the vacation mode. Right. We go back and identify a couple of your best times, and then we spend some time in your imagination going there, and going there many, many times it becomes more and more vivid. The more vivid it becomes, the more you get in touch with those emotional feelings. Now, we do with some people, we go beyond that. We say, hey, uh, uh, sometimes you get nervous and you need a little uh, courage. We can go back and isolate those times in your life and do that. Hmm. Now, some people may want to draw on something they have nothing in their life to draw on. Hmm. We actually now are working on transplants. <laughs> we can take, so, I'll tell you one thing, we're very successful. Yeah. We have taken, for people that sometimes need to stand up, this, that, that, we take John Wayne movies. Yeah. I'm picturing like the Matrix, like you plug something yeah. in and like yeah. it like puts memories into their brain or something. Do that and you can transfer those feelings mm. make them your own. That's a little tricky, but um, so in other words, you want to be able to call on that stuff, not pretend, not make it up, not just imagine, but bring it to who you are at the moment. Very, very exciting. Yeah. So where does the number go? I hope it doesn't go directly to your. I'm your gonna bedroom. transfer to. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to hear your marketing mind working too oh. on this. So where, like, what's your thought? How does that work as far as where the number goes and. Well, you know, I'm I'm getting that all set up. Okay. I think one of the greatest marketing tools right now is Facebook. Okay. okay. I know when I was with Bottom Line and we mailed a marketing director, we mailed 150 million pieces in yeah. some of those. It's a lot of mail. Yeah. And we did a lot of testing. And with the large mailings, we could get in several panels with numbers that were statistically relevant. But you had to wait to get those results. Right, right. With Facebook, I can go and I can test things. And really target the people I'm going to be selling to. Right, right. Get answers right away. Is this name going to work better than that name? Is this the better headline? And it's phenomenal what that gives you the opportunity to do. And that's new. You know, Google was a big breakthrough because you had people reaching out to you that were pros good prospects instead of the other way around, right, which was right. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. But, um, Facebook is an amazing, yeah, and it's yeah. you it very inexpensively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, yeah. I can't wait to hear about this because you come from a unique background, and you've mailed hundreds of millions of direct mail, and so yeah. like, 
the, the me, you know, if you could do that, out. you could do anything. But yeah, go on. Let me do a shout out to to Brian Kurtz. Yeah. Who then was you know the main guy in direct mail for many years. Yeah. And the brilliant guy. I don't know if you've met him. Yes, I love Brian. Yes. One of the nicest, most generous people. Brilliant. I agree. Yeah. Probably the best direct mail marketer, direct marketer in the country now. Yeah. So tell me, I want to, uh, there's so many things I want to ask you, Ken, but, but okay. I, I do have on my list to talk about Brian and, and you. When did you first meet Brian? What things did you guys work on together? Well, you know, Brian, oh my gosh, wow, I don't know, this goes back to the 80s. You know, I hate to say that, because <laughs> I know you're going to say, my guy, you don't look that old. You missed your opportunity. Right. You missed the opportunity. And that's assumed. I already told you in the beginning. Yeah, and, and, and Brian... Uh, and I worked together, but actually he came in there as I was leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked a lot of stuff with Brian and Marty. Mm -hmm. I, could I tell a couple of things about Marty? Great Go thing. ahead, yeah. Uh, just to give you an example to illustrate a concept we're going to talk about. When I first became direct marketer, we had a mailing going out. Uh, uh, and there was a mailing at one of the letter shops that mails it out, they made a mistake and they inserted the wrong uh, mail, the wrong piece in the wrong order. Mm. And that, we figured, wound up costing us about $30,000. Not um, 30000 then was probably $50,000. It's not a huge amount, but not pleasant. One of my first mm. meetings as marketing director of Marty was, was about this. So I, I went in and I told him what happened and he said, okay, what are we going to do to make it better? And I said, Marty, you don't understand. We did everything right. We gave them the right instructions. They messed up. We did everything right. And he said, okay. By the way, he did not get angry. He's very calm. He said, okay, if that's what I want to deal with it, then what are we going to do? We're going to fire these people? No, they've been good vendors. So what do we do if it's all on them? Right. So he said, look, we understand how it works in a letter shop. Uh, they may be working th three shifts, you know, getting people in, coming in, and some people may not show up. There's a lot of noise, you know, sometimes it'll be very frantic. So in this environment, they read the instructions and make a mistake. Okay, what can we do to help them read the instructions more clearly? Right. He said, why don't you take some of these instructions and write them on big sheets of paper and crayon? I said, okay, yeah, we do that, no more mistakes. His thing was always never blaming. It was always, what can I do? What can we do right. to make it better? Yeah. You know, and that was a it's very... A great leader to have, yeah. Yeah, and that's where iPower came from, which, which we ran around the country teaching, Marty developed iPower, which was really a continuous improvement thing. And that applied to your personal life, your relationship. What can I do to communicate better? There's always one, what can I do to show that person I appreciate them more? Asking yourself those questions, by the way, stimulates the subconscious mind to come up with creative solutions because you're actually feeding those suggestions down to your subconscious mind. So it's incredibly powerful. So that concept was something that Marty practiced. It was very instrumental to boardroom success. And one other thing that I remember Marty said that had a huge impact, he says, don't hurt anyone unless you mean to. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, which means basically we're very thoughtless sometimes in what we say to people hmm. and how we communicate with people and the things we do and we hurt people when we don't mean to. Yeah. Now, there are some times you may make a conscious decision that the situation demands that you act in a certain way and you do that with clear thought and with good motives. But he said, if that's not what you're doing, then you really have to learn in your communications not to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And I, by the way, have one example. When I was doing seminars around the country, and um, I had a great guy working for me in, in the department, and uh, he would send out boxes with the workbooks and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. One time I blew up at him. I shouldn't have, and I did. Probably the only time I lost it. I just lost it. And when it was over and I apologized, I said, you know what? This is going to come back and bite me. And a couple months later, I went to a uh, seminar, opened up the book. Got a couple hundred people in the seminar. I had like five workbooks. Mm. People, whether they're consciously aware or not, when you do that to somebody, it's going to come back and hit you. It may mm. take a while. 
So you re you, for for just for self preservation, yeah, you have to watch out. And that leads to one more lesson I learned yeah. from Matt Johnson, the basketball player. Powerful. I'm just getting some powerful, powerful lesson. I was on a TV show, and he was a guest on the show. And uh, he was talking about this. Um, he up in Harlem. He was working with a bank there to communicate and and teach people who didn't have bank accounts, didn't understand that process, how to do it. Wonderful program. And then they brought a basket hoop in. And but um, did you get to play with him? I <laughs> okay. Know. But when he was coming off, and I was sitting aside there, I got up and I went over to him and I said. Mr. Johnson, I really, really respect what you're doing. He stopped. He looked at me in the eye. He took my hand. And he said, do you really think so? And I said, yes. And he said, I thank you very much. Hmm. I felt so good. Good about him, but good about myself. And I realized one of the great rules of, rules of communication. You help someone feel good about themselves. They're going to like you very much indeed. You help them feel a little worse. They're not going to like you, conscious or subconscious level. Short communications where you really communicate on a sincere mm. level yeah. makes people feel important. I would walk around sometimes in companies where I'm consulting and someone, you know, a manager and owner saying, you know, these people are the most, you know, I really think they're really important. They yeah. walk around, they don't know anybody's name. Mm-hmm. No one, one of the most important words in English language to any people is their name. Right. When you're constantly talking to someone every day and you don't know their name, that's saying more about how you feel and it will make them feel bad about themselves and not like you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why those communications, short, but, you know, make them feel good about themselves. Yeah. In a positive, you know, not in a phony way. Right. And Ken, so you have an interesting... Story about how you first met Marty. Yeah. I was, I've been involved in karate. I started karate when I was like 17 years old. Yeah. And I continued to 1991 formally training. So did you, I have a question on this for a second. So I have two daughters, right? Yeah. Did you ever make sure Chloe did karate to fend off men? Like that, that's one of the things on my mind too. So No. Chloe resisted. Hmm. For whatever reason, my wife trained too. And I, what I would always tell parents, I said, don't force your kids. Mm -hmm. If they don't respond to it, yeah. give them some opportunities. But she went into other things, yeah. physical activities, which she was, enjoyed and did very well in. So I, I wish, you know, it's, it's funny, she's now going to take a self defense course mm. somewhere. And I'm going, you great. You can teach her. <laughs> that was my thing. She would never let me. That's okay. Right, right. But, you know, I think it's good for kids if you go to the right kind of school. And I don't mean style. you got to take a look at the yeah. instructor and how they treat okay. the kids. I thought you were going to just give me a tip on how I can force karate on them and make yeah. them take it for self-defense. So, um, I think expose it to them. Yes. But, you know, that, that's all you can do. Oh, you could insist, yeah. you know, self-defense particularly. Right. So, anyways, you started well, when you were 17. I'll let you get back to it. Yeah. He was a student. He's my one of my students. I was his first teacher, hmm. and um, that's how I got involved in it. And uh, he a couple of times offered me jobs at the company, and I said no. And then he said, "Hey, would you like to write some articles for us? We do interviews and write up the interviews." So I said, "Yeah, sure." And I, the first one I did, which I didn't think went well. And I got off the phone, the phone immediately rang, it was Marty, and I go, oh my God, how did he know so soon? <laughs> and he said, you know, our managing editor, bottom line person, was leaving, would you like to do that? Hmm. And I said, Marty, I've never done that before. You know, I mean, I write, write and stuff, but I've never, you know, that this was a, a really good publication with professionals. Yeah. And he said, I think you do a great job, and don't worry about it, I won't let you do bad. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did it, and it was like stretching. I really stretched out, you know, and got more, learned a lot very, very quickly. That's and a huge position. It, it was, you know, at that time, bottom line personal had a circulation of about 300,000. Mm -hmm. uh, later it went up to, I think, about 2.1 million. And I think at the peak, 
Boardroom had about 3.5 million subscribers if you take all the publications. Yeah. These were fully paid. Yeah. Yeah, give people a sense of, so what did that look like? Um, you know, if there were 300,000 subscribers, what were people getting? What were they? Because this isn't free subscribers. These people are paying uh, a fee. They're paying. Yeah. They got great information. There were two ways we got information there. One we, we Marty really came up with great great questions that he thought people wanted answered, and he had that he was in sync. Uh, and then we'd find an expert, a really good expert, and we'd do an interview. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd write up that interview and we'd send it to the expert and say, "Is this what you wanted to say?" It was important to us that that information was not someone's interpretation, but it was the actual words of the expert. That's what we wanted to communicate. Right. Great articles on all kinds of things, finance and health. So that was a good portion of the publication. Then we did something called brainstorms. We went through literally hundreds and hundreds of publications. Uh, we had people ripping. And we took bullets, uh, little bits of information that were highly accurate and really were ahas. Something, mm -hmm. ah, here's something in health, aha, finance, aha. And we'd put 50 or 60 of those in there. We'd always put the source, give them credit. And often we would, again, call that person, yeah. get in touch with them, because sometimes people are quoted in publications, they're misquoted right. or misinterpreted. Right. And we wanted to make sure they were accurate. Right. And that, those publications did tremendous. And we had a business one, the consumer one. We had one for finance. Uh, I I subscribe actually I get I get them and I have several books over here that are from Bottom Line Books yeah oh Bottom Line Books is great too yeah yeah, yeah we we were selling a you know a million and a half million books every year too back then as well as having all those subscribers yeah and, uh, and no advertising there was no advertising in the publications then hmm so you know. Um, that's when we did the seminars around the country. All we had to put was a couple of sentences, and pe people showed up and asked at the seminars because that's how they trusted us. Where'd the idea from the seminars? When did those well, start? Well, you know, I had been away from the company a while, and Marty called me up, and they hey, had developed this iPower program yeah. at the company. It did amazing things for growth, for employee retainment, all kinds of great things. He said, hey, I want to give this away. I'm not interested in making money. Let's give it away. So why don't you develop a seminar, and we'll, in New York we had this wonderful place, an office, and we had a penthouse, a beautiful penthouse with a 360 degree view of the city, you know, and it was just fabulous. We'll do seminars up there, and we'll share it. Mm -hmm. And he had to out to him. Mm -hmm. So I developed a seminar, and I, we scheduled about, I think, five seminars for the end of, and I can't remember the year. Mid I'm, I'm horrible with these. So, yeah. And uh, we got this overwhelming response. People started calling up and be huge response. Uh, we got people coming from around the world. Wow. I mean, other countries. So, we, we, we up to about 11, 12 seminars the last couple of weeks. Um, and I, th I, don't, I don't know if they're free or we charge like 19, you know, something. Nominal fee. And. Uh, but we found that a lot of people, there were no-shows. So we started raising the price so people would come. Mm -hmm. And we raised it. And every time we raised the price, um, we'd get more stick. And it never deterred anyone from signing. You know, we still had packed places. Yeah. So it turned out we made a little money, even though Marty didn't, was not his uh, intention. Right. But we spread it. And then we had so many people come around the country, we said, hey, Let's uh, go on the road. Let's go on the road. And we went, we go into about 50, 60 cities several wow. times a year. Um, he, here's another important lesson. Yeah. I, I, interrupt me. Anytime. No, I want you to, sp I, you know, you're taking the words out of my mouth because throughout I want you to, I have written down here um, big lessons, big successes, big mistakes. So throughout, fill Great. those in. Yeah. Th this is a mistake that we learn from. We, we, I remember one time we we're going to Chicago, and, and we had a, a good room there. We had a lot of people coming. And Marty said, hey, you know, as long as we're going to Chicago, let's put an uh, ad in the pa big paper there, and we'll get more people. Um, 
and we'll do a full page ad. We'll do remnant and so on. On the the week before, we had a full page ad in the Sunday business section for the seminar. We got a really good copywriter, paid really you good money. You guys know a lot of good copywriters, yes. Yeah. Got good design, and we put it in. And we got about three or four calls, and nobody signed up. Mm. Now, the interesting thing, I had called, and I can't remember his name. He was founder of Career Track Seminars. I don't know if they're on Jim something. And I had asked him about this, yeah. and he said it's not going to work. Hmm. He said we've tested it and tested it. doesn't work. Now, for some seminars, finance, certain kind of seminars do draw. It works. Yeah. For your kind of seminar, it's not going to work. Well, you know, Marty said, hey, that's... You know, why not? Take it? He had the money to do it. He's it wasn't, try it. You know, and it didn't work. And and if that had been me starting my company, I would, I would, you know, I could have lost all my parents and friends' money. Right. And and so the lesson from that is, you want to find experts that have experience, knowledge. Yeah. People that have really done it before. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of books and all kinds, but if you could find someone who's really done it, those people are very valuable. Now, it doesn't mean it wouldn't have worked, but we'd have had done something different. Right. It could have been the exact same thing they had done before, and it hadn't worked. Right. So that, that kind of thing uh, is, we call it success knowledge. Fine, and that's someone who has done it. Yeah. And uh, that would have saved us a lot of money. So can talk about you develop this 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 seminar. What what kind of things did you think about when developing it, and what did it turn out to to be uh, towards the towards the middle of it? Right. Well, the time management came later. For iPower, again, we had a system. We taught people how to put it into their company, and from you know all the nuts and bolts, how to get the something going. And a lot of companies did it and had good success. Mm -hmm. But but my purpose, what I as I went on was saying, hey, this is not only great for the company, it's great for the individual. Because what it did was get people thinking every day how I could do things better with themes. And that went down to the subconscious mind, and pretty soon people were looking around the subconscious level, how could I do this better? It had a huge, huge impact on people. Mm -hmm. Part of it, though, is I wanted people to experience something, to experience a change during that seminar. Yeah. And what I did was I came up with a way to learn names very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it came with how could I do this better? And it was a four-step thing that was right. very quick. So most people have trouble learning names. Yeah. So when people came in the door, I would say hello, and they'd tell me their name, and I'd you know, do a few things, and then they'd go off into the seminar. And the most ever this was 139 people in Phoenix. That was the biggest group I did most, you know. And um, yes. yeah, and then they, they, they'd uh, sit down, and 10 or 15 minutes of the seminar, I'd say, how many people have trouble with names in life? And almost everyone would raise their hand. And then I'd go around the room and I'd just tell everybody their name. Hmm. Wow. But then the important thing, I said, I said I'm going to show, teach you something right now very quickly that's going to help you remember names. Yeah. So I taught him this little system. Then I said, go meet 10, 12, 15 people, walk around the room, not just the people around you, and use this. And then at the end of the seminar, two and a half hours later, I would say, look around the room, who remembers the names, which everyone. Here was the point. I said, if you can learn something in just a few minutes, that it makes you better in something you've had trouble with all your life, yeah. what can you do if you really tune in to this process of learning? What can you change if this is something that's bothered you all your life? And now look what you did in literally four minutes of learning this. Yeah. What change is possible? That was experiencing something. I wasn't just telling them right. that to show them something that were, and it was very impactful. They experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why people call you a dynamic speaker, is because you, you let them experience something. That's a good yeah. distinction. I, yeah. I think that's the way people learn. Yeah. We learn. Uh, and you, you, you try to figure out what can you do to have that transition 
because unless someone does that transition in their own mind, yeah. it's not going to last. Yeah. So how can I remember more names? <laughs> well, it was a simple... For, first of all, the reason most people don't remember names is they're not paying attention. Yeah. They're really not paying attention. And, and the yeah. mind is like a computer. You have to feed it in correctly. If you feed it in correctly, the mind's going to remember. Now, this was short term. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying if I met these people six months later, I was going to remember their name. Yeah. But I remembered for several days, and it was someone I was interacting with, I'd have no problem with the name. Yeah. Um, so what I would do is, I'd, first thing you do is say hello to them, maybe shake their hand, look at them very carefully, not like a stalker, but really <laughs> look at them, and repeat the name back to them several times. Hmm. You know, Jesse, very nice to meet you. Jesse, do you know so and so? No, Jesse, why don't you go find your seat? You know, whatever, just several times. Yeah. So that's two. Really look, two, repeat the name several times. And the last thing I do was in the next 30 seconds or a minute, I look around the room and I'd find you, see you, and I'd repeat your name to myself. If I didn't remember it, then I'd go up to you. Just say, I'm sorry, I really want to remember it, and I'd get it. Mm -hmm. And I'd find just doing that. And of course, the more I did it, the better I got at it. Yeah. Just doing that was enough to register in my subconscious mind that it took over. Yeah. So it really mattered paying attention and getting it in because we don't do that. So that's all I showed people. Yeah. And they did it with 12, 15 people. And then I got a lot of communications from people. A lot of people didn't use it. So, didn't Ken, it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting, you know, I, like I told you, I watch a lot of videos um, on you. And one of them that sticks out is asparagus. Yes. Tell me about asparagus. Well, I can't. Uh, I'll tell you what it is, but I can't tell you how it works. <laughs> That's I, horrible. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. Because I don't want to, you know, a lot of people going to watch it. I would tell you. Yeah, yeah. But I, it, it's really very interesting. Again, it, it's working on the subconscious level. Yeah, so I mean, set the stage. So you're giving a talk. And yeah. So what's a talk on... So what I, what I'm usually, I do a lot of speaking, and again, yeah. someone wants to call for that, and I do a lot of coaching, if someone wants to call for that, that's good, I'm putting a little plug there. I'm um, basically, again, it's demonstrating something to people yeah. that they can then experience, they can turn around and experience it. Right. So what I would do, I'd have, I'd have like six, seven really strong people have come here, strong men and women, I get yeah. some really strong people up there. And I'd say, I'd like you to put your fist straight out like this. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to move your hand. You're right. And, and you're a fourth degree black belt, yeah. so, yeah. And, and I said, don't let me. And they would, and the truth is, I mean, I, had a, I, mean, I maybe could have done it, but it was hard. I mean, there was a lot of resistance there. Right. And then I said to him, look, I'm going to come right now and I'm going to do the same thing. But when I, I want you to say the word asparagus when I ask you to. Right. So I'd be there pushing, I said asparagus, and I'd switch to one finger and just move it. Right. So every time they said the word experience, these big strong people would seem to lose strength. I can't tell you the principle behind <laughs> it here, but I just want to add, I've had that done to me by a couple of chiropractors. Hmm. I'm not, not knocking the professional. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's like, it's a way to have people believe sometimes that you're really doing something that's, you know, indicating. Like people are muscle testing things, yes. And I mean, you know, I, I knew exactly what they were doing. Were they consciously aware of what they were doing? I don't know. But I know it can be done. Any, anybody can do that. And I think some people use that as a way to convince people. Hmm. I'm not trying to denigrate chiropractors. I know some wonderful yes, chiropractors. Like myself, things. exactly. Yeah. You know, they do amazing good stuff. Yeah. But there are people out there in the profession or in other areas. Yeah. It's a great way um, to get people to believe in you. I've seen people in front of an audience and it, it you know, it's quite it's quite effective. Yeah. So for that particular case, obviously you can't tell how you do it or, but but what were you demonstrating? Because it only showed a clip. Um, yeah, it didn't show. Yeah. I, w I was trying to demonstrate in the world some things that seem one way mm -hmm. are really something else. Mm -hmm. But I was also trying to demonstrate, and this is a business thing, yeah. 
to really have success, you have to know how things really work. Right. Below the level. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's so important to learn and to work with good people who have success knowledge. Because here's, I could have got everyone in the room in there, and they would have all had, couldn't resist me. Right. And sometimes something in business just doesn't work. Yeah. You can't figure it out. Why isn't it working? And underneath that, I can move it with one finger. Why? Because I know how. Mm -hmm. I know how to do it. You don't. And there's a lot of things in business you could do. You're smart enough. You're strong enough. You're ambitious enough. Right. You just don't know how to do to, to get that new customer, right. to motivate your people. Yeah. And you may not even know you know, that the real danger is when, you know, if you don't know something, you know you don't know it. Right. That's one thing. When there's something out there that is really going to help you and you don't even know you don't know it, it's like right. invisible to you. Yeah, like the you unconscious know. incompetence. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's where you need to work with good people. Are you going to constantly beat your head against the wall? Yeah. And wonder, work, working harder and harder. Yeah. It's almost like a magician. Like, I don't actually want to know the trick, but I do, but I do want to know it. <laughs> yeah. Type of thing, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and a lot of those things just a matter of knowledge. Yeah. I love magic, and I watch a lot of videos. Mm -hmm. The great... Um, no, who's that great guy that's been debunking a lot of stuff? I know who exactly you're talking about. Yeah, there's like a Netflix documentary on him too. Yeah, and I went and I went to the theater and I saw that, and he does wonderful stuff because there's a lot of the cons, a lot of the people who go up, you know, in front of the audience, people suddenly walk again and right. And yes, that. there there are some legitimate stuff potentially that, but there's a lot of chicanery that goes on there. Right, and yes. and you know, but people don't know it. Yes. And again, it's, it's the knowledge, the information. Yes. I highly recommend that Netflix. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so, Joe, which I'm bringing Joe Posh from him. Joe Posh, he does consulting. Brilliant guy. There's a guy who knows how things on a, on a deep level should be done. Yeah. You know, I mean, a day with Joe Polish, and I know he's not inexpensive, yeah. is something that people are going to make their money if they pay attention. Right. If they apply it, yeah, you know he's going to reveal things. You're going to go. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't see that. Oh my God! You know, and really change your business. Yeah. He's yes. got that. So I want to hear your lessons, big lessons from Joe Polish. Because I saw a video of he giving you a fruitcake. There's a video of you at David Letterman. There's a video of you at some museum with a bear skeleton. Um, so what are some big lessons that you've learned from from Joe? Joe's an amazing guy on so many different levels. Um, you know, I, 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 the way I met Joe when I was doing the seminars, and I think I was out in Phoenix where he works, and he came with a couple of people, mm -hmm. uh, including Eunice, Eunice Miller, who's been with him for years, and she's an incredible lady. Um, he came, and I met him afterwards. And then several months later, I, know, I was in Chicago, and he was there with some people. Another city, he was there. I said, it's great. So I... Got to know him. I went to watch an event he did. Um, and I was so impressed because he was selling something. And I was impressed how he set that up financially. But what I really liked is he gave you so much good information hmm. to really run your business. I was writing things down. I said, this is great stuff. If you didn't buy anything, you got that. If I mean, if you went to that thing, you're going to be a better business person, you know, Twofold, threefold, fourfold. Then he saw, but he gave he gave content, yeah. good content. And you know, a lot of times, a lot of people that were selling from the stage, it was all kind of just you know manipulating you in this. No, he, he was there. giving great value. Right. You could have walked out of there and said, "This is great." If you bought his stuff, he sold, and that's the other thing. He sold good stuff. He was good quality. Yeah. And he started as a carpet cleaner. Yeah. Struggling. And then he got into some marketing, and he started doing really well. And eventually, he said, let me just teach marketing. Yeah. So he had, then he had these events I went to, bringing in you know, 1,000, 1,500 carpet cleaners. He had these platinum clubs and stuff like that. And I went year after year. And I went to a lot of other people's. And what I began to realize, you know, he had people come back that really were growing their business. He was really delivering good stuff. Yeah. I went to some places where I think they're living bullshit. 
<laughs> and all he's trying to do is make money. Right. But Joe's really was the real deal. Joe yeah. was the real deal. And he he went beyond that. I'll tell you one more story yeah. about Joe, and I think I have it right. Joe, first of all, knows everybody. And pe and he's good. He's a guy that make you feel good about yourself. That principle. He really connects with people. He's got a great heart and a brilliant mind. So he decided at one time he wanted to know Richard Branson. Not just to say hello, but to, you know, become a friend. And I think he admired him and it would be good for, you know, everything. So I think he bought t his mother, Richard Branson's mother has a charity. And so he bought tickets to an event. I think he got a table. So he went over to, you know, Branson would say hello to anybody because, you know, that was the event and he's very friendly and Joe went over, talked to him, got along real well. Uh, left, came back a little later and said, hey, you know, I have an event. He had one of his big events come in a couple of months, you know, in, in Phoenix with a thousand, twelve hundred people. He said, would you come and speak at my event? I'd really like that. And Branson said, you know, it's really nice. Yes, I really don't do that kind of thing. But I, I'm, I'm flat. You know, something like that. And Joe went back and he thought, and he took a pencil and he figured out how much profit am I going to make at that event, you know, and he fudged it so he wouldn't go under. And this isn't, this isn't the gross. This is just netting. Right, right. So he we went over to Branson, and he said, "Look, if I donated five hundred thousand dollars to your mom's charity, would you come and speak?" And Branson said, yeah. <laughs> and more than just that yeah. connection, they got to be friends. Uh, Branson has a place called Nestor Island. And it's a beautiful place. His own little island, you know, tennis courts, swimming pools, houses. I mean, just a really beaches, really great place. And Joe worked out with, with Branson that he would bring eight or nine, ten, or fifteen entrepreneurs, really bright entrepreneurs, to the island to get together to network. I think he charged $25,000 a person. This money goes to the charity. And it's great connection. Branson shows up for at least a couple of days, and he's a, apparently, you know, likes to party in a good way, you know, a really great guy, very personable. So everybody sort of mingles, has a great time. Mm -hmm. And these people learn a lot and they make connections and often make deals. Yeah. Because these are really good people. Yeah. So he's got to, you know, and I think he's made millions of dollars for that charity. But there, this is Joe. He said, I want to make this happen. He figured out a way to make it happen. Yeah. Now, and he's not a friend. When he was in that carpet cleaning business, learning marketing, he went and he went to all the great people. He got all the great tapes. He put on his credit card. He didn't let, he didn't say, Oh, I can't afford it. Right. He understood the value. When he wanted to get close to Richard Branson, he understood the value. He didn't say, Oh, I can't. He went. Now, I'm not saying everyone should do that. Right. But he had the courage yeah. and the belief in himself, which he has. And I can't tell you the people he knows that, that and I, I mean, knows. Like Ken Glickman. Yeah, well, yeah. he's, you know, but, you know, I mean, really, yeah. um, the people he's connected with, and he's he does good stuff with them. It's not just, just oh, I know this, I know this. These are people he works with. He connects with other people. If you got something you need, a car, yeah. he knows somebody. Yeah. And Constantly say, providing values for people. Polish told me to call you. They pick up the phone. Yeah. So... For a second, thank you for sharing that, Ken. I, you know, because I want to hear the Joe Paul Amazing lessons. Man. Amazing. I, I want to hear more Marty lessons too. So I want to go back to to uh, bottom line personal for a second when you were there, and you know, some of the example. What of the campaigns were you? Do you remember working or not working at the time that we could learn from? Well, I, I think one of the biggest lessons is that, and this is for a lot of people, the the, the marketing. Yeah. A lot of the tones. A lot of the mail was not of my taste. And a lot of people felt that way. And I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned right away, Marty would say, oh, that's fine, but, but your opinion here doesn't count for that much. <laughs> the opinion that counts is the people we're, we're selling to. Right. They vote. That's, see, that's one of the great things about direct response. You know right away <laughs> whether the copy's good. 
because people, but they don't buy it. It's not good. So the copy that was working and really selling was stuff that some of us thought, and, and then some Mario let us test the stuff we thought would be really good. didn't work. Right. And you learned you could have 20 of the greatest marketing gurus in a room coming up with what they thought was the greatest copy. Yeah. It'd be more likely to work, but it didn't matter. The only thing mm -hmm. that mattered was your customer, right? And what they thought. That, right. that was a big lesson. Because I'm yeah. thinking, my mama got to the sooner you test it. get something out there and test it. Yeah. People work a long time sometimes on the project. That's different if you're working in the scientific community. But even there, you want to get the results out and let it. The sooner you can get something out there to the people, because you may think you have the greatest thing. The people are going to, you know, mousetrap going to come to your home. Maybe, maybe not. The sooner you know that. Yeah. And that's tough because a lot of people don't want to know the truth. Right. <laughs> you know. What was one of those, Ken, that you remember being surprised about that worked so well that you were like, no one's going to buy this? Well, so many. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, after I was there a while, I understood. Right, right. You know. But, you know, there were, Marty had a lot of publications he put out there. It didn't work. It didn't work. Um, not all of them worked. That was part of, you know, his testing. Yeah. So some of his ideas hit big pay days, yeah. and he had a lot of those. But I remember he had ones, you know, and, and again, that was a lesson. No matter how smart or how successful you are, you're not going to score on bullseyes. Right. And that's something we all we all have to learn. I, I don't know how much time we have left. I, I, there's a cu couple. Go ahead. Of we have we have plenty of time if you have okay. time. Yeah. Because something just came to mind, but yeah. it was somewhere else. So again, this. Um, I worked with a dear friend of mine, Marilyn Adler. After yeah. I worked for her. Yeah. She was a friend from Ohio. <laughs> Actually, we came to New York in 1969. We were engaged. Really? Um, but that didn't work out. But years later, wow. she had a company called Creative Targets that she developed on yeah. her own. Yeah. She had um, got divorced. She had a son. She needed money. She had done some work. So she got an idea. And basically, like American Express at that time, was not seeking out college students because they felt college students would not be good risk. And that was true of all the credit card companies. Right. And she had done some work for someone in the college market. So she came, came up with a plan. And she went to American Express offices, couldn't get an appointment, so she sat there, or all of the walk by in, in the reception area. I don't know for how long, a week or two. And finally, she so very attractive, well, you know, so finally some someone came by and said, "Okay, I'll see you." Some guy came, and they liked it. She pitched it, and she um, made a success of it. Yeah. And that's, but by the way, when I mentioned she's very attractive, that, that primate, but, you know, she is dealing with, she delivered value. That's not why anyone, you know. Right. May have got her in for that first meeting walking by, but she delivered great value. And she started working with Fortune 500 companies, all the, all, yeah. the, all the credit card companies. Yeah. I've um, written down here IBM, Pontiac, Citibank, Zenith. I mean, her yeah. list, those are ones I wrote, her list, yeah. you know, was unbelievable and she did a couple of things. She developed a win-win situation. Her business was based on this. At that time, you, if you're a commercial company, you really couldn't get on campus and promote yourself. The, the administrations didn't like that. So if an American Express was going to get on, it was very hard. How do you do it? Yeah. Well, let me tell you, she did, I worked with Pontiac. Yeah. Okay. So her concept of win-win-win-win. What she would do, okay, she, Pontiac wanted to get their cars... Like in the in the circle, student, you, whatever the place, student green, where all the students pass. Yeah. She wanted to get their cars there, that people could see, and then be all given offers to go to the dealer and drive and whatever. And she wanted to get posters and sign, get them promoted around the campus. Yeah. So most campus organizations, and again, I don't know what it is now. We're going back some years. Uh, had to put on some kind of special project, community service project during the year. The fraternities, the other organizations. Right, right. You know, the Rachi. Okay. So she would come up with a pro. So she, this program, and she always a cause she believed in, yeah. uh, Students Against a Driving Drunk. I think that was the name of the organization. I shouldn't have said that because it's going to hurt me to... Uh, 
Okay. I hope these people aren't around anymore. <laughs> okay. Maybe. I can maybe. Google them. Yeah, see, see that. Anyway, not Mother's Against Driving. Anyway, wonderful guy who ran that. Very important organization. Did amazing, amazing things. He's a great guy. Okay, so it's a matter. So she went and said, okay, let's bring you on the campus. <laughs> um, you'll come up with a contract that students will sign to really make them aware of this and committed, and we'll, we'll educate them. Right. And um, we'll hook that up with, a, with an organization. It'll be their event. And then she went to make the event very exciting. People would sign contracts. She got uh, like a record company to send seats. She filled one of the cars totally with CDs. And then people guessed and somebody won a big prize. Mm. It's stuff like that. She brought radio stations there to broadcast and have parties. She got T-shirts, put up banners all over the campus. A big thing like that. Put it all together. And then she had to sell it to the administration. She really had three pieces here. The administration, four actually. The student group. Students Against Driving Drunk and the car company, Pontiac. Those were the players. Now, when you're putting this together, you've got the thing where you go to Pontiac and you tell them about Students Against Driving and they say, okay, if you got them, we're interested. Right. You don't really have them. They're, it's, they're interested. You go to them and you tell them, and say, yeah, we're interested if you got Pontiac. Right. So, you know, so it's that whole thing of pulling it together. <laughs> okay. Very successful event. A couple of things, though. Yeah. I don't know, a month or a couple of weeks before it was going to happen, everything seemed to be in place. Marilyn had gone to Hawaii with her husband, Larry, and I'm in the office there, and somebody gives me the phone and says it's the guy from Driving Truck, who's a wonderful guy, did great work, but this was, and he had called Pontiac himself, the, the guy in charge, of, which was really not a good thing and said he wanted a car. They're doing this project, he said. And the guy at Pontiac really freaked out. He said, we don't do that. If that's the way it's gonna be, the deal's off. Then the guy from Pontiac called the office and he's irate. I got this call, we don't work that way, we're not gonna do it, we're, we don't wanna do this project. Yeah. So now this is a situation, you got two of these people really mad at each other. So I call Marilyn in Hawaii, and I get her right before she's leaving. And she said, okay, in 10 minutes, do a conference call. Let's get them all in the conference call. Marilyn is the most positive person in the world. She almost has this mystical power to bring positive energy. Mm -hmm. About 15 minutes on the phone, and I don't remember what she said, she had both these people back online. Hmm. From Hawaii, I think the guy was one guy in Massachusetts, the other guy in Detroit. Amazing power, but she developed this win-win-win thing. Everybody won. Right. And it was a big, we had like a hundred campuses. I remember, um, like we had, you had to put security with those cars at night and stuff in the day. So I, th I forget um, what's one of the big companies we were with. I can't remember the name right now. Anyway, one night I get a call from a guy out in California. It's a Friday night, one of the student reps. <coughs> and he said the security guard didn't show up, and he's there. And he said it's getting dark, and it's, it was a place that wasn't, the, you know, he had these brand Not new... Not the safest. Yeah. So I'm trying to... God, what's the name of that company? You recognize it right now. What are some of the big security companies? Anyway, you know, I, I, I told the guy, go home. I don't care if the cars get broken into or stolen. You know, I don't want you to just get out of there. He wouldn't do it. So I'm trying to track down the guy manager in charge of this, find out where he lives to call him up so he can get somebody out there, um, <coughs> which you're able to do. So all kinds of stuff like that. A lot of that. fires. But yeah. I, I know when we went to get... Oh, and there's something else. Okay. So after about two years, very successful project, Pontiac loved it. And then the guy who was managing got a, pr a promotion, moved away from a project. Someone new came in, and Marilyn said, that's the end of, the, end of our project there. We're going to be canceled. I said, what? Wow, successful program. She said, look, this is not the new guy's project. There's no feather in his cap 
to continue someone else's project no matter how well it does. This guy's mm -hmm. got to do his own thing. Interesting. And sure enough, she was right. Mm. Another thing she taught me, which is really good, she said, when you're going to go pitch, and you got people in the room you're pitching to, <coughs> and the main decision maker may not even be in the room, yeah. or there's several other people not there, now you're trusting, you did a great presentation, <coughs> you're trusting those people to be able to communicate effectively what you just told them. And it's not going to work. Most people can't do that. Yeah. There's a watered-down version. says you got to leave things. you got to come in here with a presentation you could leave behind. And not something that's thick writing. You know, you should get really good cartoonists. And you get people in there to leave something behind yeah. that was dynamite, that was easy to absorb, that she would leave so they could give the message to these people you couldn't count, not that they weren't good people, you know, so that was, and she did a great job, it was really creative. Yeah. yeah, what was Ken something you remember that was, I'm trying to visualize that something she left behind that, uh, that's a really good idea, I just don't know what I would leave behind. <laughs> well, she, sometimes it would be a video, which in those days, we're talking about the 80s, 90s, um, early 90s wasn't a thing. But if she was going to do something at that point, she wanted to communicate. Again, a lot of times uh, with cartoonists, she'd get the message in something that was fun mm -hmm. and easy to read. Yeah. And if there was going to be anybody with another language, because sometimes it's international stuff, she'd find out that what it was. She'd have it translated. She'd make it very easy to read. She'd make it very clear what they needed to do to move forward, very clear. So the benefits were very clear, fun to read, uh, and the highlights and, and the terms. Yeah. And it was just something that was, you know, again, it's so much better because I tell you about my project. And I'm telling you, all enthusiastic. Now you're going to go and tell someone else. Right. And then they have to pitch it to another person. Yeah. What's going to be left? And that's why Marilyn was a very enthusiastic, positive person. Yeah. So do a video. So that people picked up on that. Because it was just by virtue of her personality. I, I remember one time in New York, we were trying to get a cab. And we reached his cabinet. This has been pushed aside. And, and I don't know, I was about 15 feet away. I don't know what Marilyn said to this guy, but over 15 seconds, 20 seconds, he was smiling and stepped away and gave us a cab. That was the energy she had. Mm -hmm. So how do you communicate that? And that was important, but that concept of you got to watch out. You're not necessarily dealing. And, of course, a lot of those meetings were just people trying to pick her brain. Yeah. They didn't really want to work with her. They wanted to learn what they could do. Yeah. So, Ken, what was another big lesson from Creative Targets? So, you worked at the, the Pontiac. What was another campaign that really, that you think back on? Oh, God, I'm trying to see what I could say here. Are there certain things you can't because of uh, the client relationship? That's okay. I mean, the client relationship is gone, but there you know, was if, some... Yeah, I don't want to get you in trouble with anyone. Yeah. So, go back to, you know, the, um, the boardroom um, and... You said there, you know, obviously there's a lot that worked and something and didn't. What was a big lesson from something that I'm, didn't I'm work? Targets because something just came to mind. Yeah, go ahead. This is a little management thing. I mean, one thing I did with Ponac, I sort of ran the, the program. So we had a whole bunch of young people who worked there to implement stuff and get it done. And uh, wonderful, bright, these bright young people. It was amazing. But there was a lot of detail work, a tremendous amount. You, know, you had to deal with the student groups, 100 campuses. You had to make sure they were communicating with the dealers. You had to make sure they are communicating with the, getting their uh, T-shirts and all the banners and stuff like that, setting up, setting up the communication with the radio. I mean, we could communicate with the radio stations, but then they had to, too. Communicating with the dealers to get the cars in order to communicate with the administration. All that had to come from us. And that was on 100 campuses, so there's a lot of detail work, a lot of things that could go wrong. So one of the things I did, I walked around the notebook, and I told everyone, I want you to have a notebook. So every time I ask you something, or you tell me something, I'm going to write it down. I'm not going to forget anything, because there was so many details, right. what we talked about. 
So it's not never going to be, I don't remember, you didn't say that. And they started keeping that detail too. Really help them. And I always say, write something down. Yeah. Don't tell me you're going to remember. Yeah. So you may. You know, you'd be talking to someone, do this, and yeah. they're just they're nodding. And, and I said, how are you going to remember? Yeah. I'll rem- yeah. I don't, no, you, no, you won't. I don't, you, and you're making me tense. <laughs> and then you have to look at it. Right. I said, when you're dealing with vendors, let's say you got June 20th, something's supposed to ship. Yeah. And you're calling that vendor. You don't say, is it on time? You don't say it's going to be there by June 20th. You say to them, um, I know you're shipping and I forget the date. Can you check that for me? Oh, I don't have time. I'll wait. Well, I'll call you back at 3. That forces them, because they're so busy. You're going to be there? Tw- yeah, sure, the 20th, no problem. Maybe it's behind. I got you. Making them go and examine the records. Yeah. You have to show them these people are sharp. If I gotta let something slide, they better not be these people. Yeah. So it's all kinds of those in a very yeah. nice way. Yeah. But but you had to be forceful, and this is another thing that that a lot of people do when they're working with vendors or anything like that is they sometimes don't want to push or you know, and you got to be firm in a nice way. Yeah. You can't let people bullshit you. You have to understand that most people are busy. They're really busy. You're one of many a lot of times. And you can't be thrown off. Yeah. You've got to hold people accountable in a nice way. Yeah. By the way, something about Marty. I'm just jumping around. Go ahead. Here. Yeah. Hey, with all these young people, they did a great job. But we did that communication and we really trained them in how to make yeah. sure you're getting the right answers yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Talk about Marty. I, I wrote something down that I'm, I'm going to ask you about, about the writing down, which is powerful from one of the, the videos I watch, which you talk about with the time management and must scheduling something. Yes. And so I want to, I'm going to ask about that, but go on with the, what you're going to say with the Marty. Yeah, Marty had mm-hmm. a, 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 a vendors, and he didn't like to call them vendors. He called them partners. Yeah, and there were I'm talking about some big vendors here. You know, it's like we bought paper. You know, God, we bought lots of paper, and letter shops. We did a huge amount of business and stuff like that. And Marty would take some pictures he got and blow them up, and put them in, around the company. And he had one he had in his office, blown up real big, and it was a trapeze. People on the on the what do you call it swinging and leaping and being caught by somebody else. Right. So I had a picture of someone that had left and was in the air with hands out, with no net. He said, and the other person was coming to them. Mm. And he said, "That's like how you work with a partner, a vendor. When you turn to need that, they got to be there." Yeah. That's the relationship. Mm. You want it, as you want to do it, the people you're working with in your company or in your life. Right. You got to not, sometimes it doesn't matter, but when you're in business, you know, the competition to succeed, you can't reach and fall. Yeah. And so though he valued those relationships. Yeah. And he was never, and this is another important thing, he was not looking to get the, the best price. He wanted a fair price. Yeah. But he said, these are good people. I want them to be in business. Yeah. I want them to succeed. Right. I don't want to get taken. There were always people coming in, meeting me, to under, they could pick, uh, done less. Yeah. Probably would raise the price once I always got that. We could have saved money. Always looking for the, I mean, I, I could tell, with the, I didn't want to get ripped off by anybody. But we wanted those people to stay in business and we wanted to be able to reach. And something else he did, he paid on time. Always. Even when he first started the company. Every vendor got paid on time. He never made them wait. Mm. And they were people. I went to visit a letter shop once. And there were some other people there. I was taking us a tour. And at one point, he, he just stared into space and started, you know. And you know, when people don't pay us, I can't pay my people. Yeah. I can't get my support. And then he stopped himself. And that is one of the great tensions they have. It's a cash business. They're, they're, they got to pay their salaries. Yeah. Their vendors want money. And when you hold up money, I remember when we would do IBM, we would get t-shirts for the college campus and bookstores. We had some companies 
they didn't when they found out we dealt with General Motors, they didn't want to do it. Really? Why? They said General Motors takes forever to pay. Uh hey. We can't get them, you know, they take forever. You know, we're not a big business. We can't afford to to you know they can't bankroll it for several yeah. months without paying their employees. The people. They got, yeah. So that that is a major tension for a lot of companies. And Marty relieved that tension. He paid on time or early. He never yeah. made wait even a day. Yeah. And for that reason they would jump through hoops. Yeah. Uh, he could be tough. He wanted if he found that a test had done something and we learned something, we'd want he'd want him to turn around and uh, and they do it because we gave him a lot of business, we paid a fair price, and we took away that tension. They knew they were gonna pay the time. Yeah. So Treat Ken, speaking of vendors, what's what were you saying? He treated vendors right. Yeah. He respected them. Speaking of vendors and partners um, yeah. You, at, you know, Boardroom works with a lot of copywriters. What are some of the lessons with, with some of the copywriters that you learned? You know, I didn't have really that direct contact with mm. writers. I know Brian later did. And Brian, I think, knows all the great writers. I had a contact with a few. Mm -hmm. I just know that this was another area where Marty respect. There was one guy, I think his name was Mel Martin. And Mel Martin was a great copywriter, and he wrote the, um, oh gosh, what do you call it? Oh, you know, what not to write in an airplane, not, 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 what not to eat in an airplane, all those kind of, yeah, all yeah. Those kind of things. That, that were, that there's a name for that kind of writing, and he was really the first really good one at that. And um, Marty sort of hid him. He paid him really well. He, he was like a secret him. weapon. He didn't want him working for anybody else. He yeah. took really good care for him, picked him up when he had to go somewhere in a limo. And this guy was terrific. He sometimes would give Marty a little attention because he'd have a trouble meeting deadlines, and that was really important. But he's a brilliant copywriter, and he did a lot of this stuff in the beginning. Um, oh, gosh, this is a name I'm not going to remember. He, he, he was one of the really outstanding copywriters, wrote a great book. I have it here. This is terrible. Pull man. it out. Do you have it there? As, as we go along. Brilliant guy. Great collector of art. Um, I remember one time being in his house with Marty. And he had a house, beautiful apartment on Park Avenue. And I guess there were some artists then that would come in and do a painting on your wall in the mm -hmm. room. Like a mural or something. Yeah. And then they would be there for six months. Then they'd come back and they'd paint over it. <laughs> six months and for, that became sort of like a a thing that I don't know if it lasted but just stands out in my memory oh my god this guy was so so good brilliant guy very well known you have to get his book do you have his book somewhere in there before we end I must have moved it uh, oh I thought okay to my other office because uh, we'll have to find it say may, maybe I'll think of it yes else. You know, you'll know the name right away. I, I'm sure. Um, he had the control package for. Um, I'm not going to remember this. This is terrible. Anyway, a control package is basically the package that's won. Yeah. This is a package that's gotten your best route. Now, you're constantly trying to beat the control. Yeah. You try to do little things to tweak the control. You know, different headlines, different fonts, add a little something. Mm hmm. Uh, you hire other great cop and see if they can beat the control. Right. Now, he had a control for a major company for 13 years. Wow. Which was, you know, being tested against That's huge. Yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and another thing, you know, he learned, like, you know, a lot of uh, the great copywriters charge a lot of money. I'm going back. And, and sometimes take a piece of the action. Right. But Marty never skimped on copywriters. If he was starting a new pub publication, going to do big mailings, uh, you're going to spend a lot of money. It's like you're doing a movie. You want to get a good director. You're not going to spend all this money, you know, a a and then hire someone who doesn't know what they're doing or it's right. not as good. You, sometimes it doesn't work out anyway. Yeah. But it's a tremendous, as I think there's a business, but a tremendous respect for good copywriters. Yeah. There are some people, and they're usually... Target in one area that's great for health products. Yeah. So this is great for financial. You right. find someone their expertise. Um, yeah. I remember Bill Jamie in Hadapa was like a V person uh, back then. 
But, you know, great copywriters, really good ones that have that track record, right. you know, they, they don't grow on trees. And one thing, yeah. if you're looking for a copywriter and you're willing to pay for an experienced one, one question asked is, you know, um, do you have do you have the control package on some products? Yeah, you know how many if they've got the control the ones that have beat everyone, you know they they've done pretty well. Yeah. So Ken, what, what are some long standing controls that you remember? Do you remember any that uh, are generally what the? I know Mel had them, and this other gentleman whose name I can't remember. You know, I, I mean Marty was a big tester. Yeah. And this is another thing that's really important to know. Marty was. And the concept of how can we do better? He was always testing, and he would tell people, "You got to test. You have to test. Yeah. It's the only way. You, you're never satisfied. You're always trying to grow. And sometimes the message gets stale. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it's the little tweaks, and sometimes you hire a really great copywriter or someone who's coming up, and you say, "Okay, see if you can beat the control." Yeah. Now, now we were mailing enough that we could put aside panels like a 5,000, 10,000 names, you know, five or ten of those per mail, and you need to have that number statistically relevant, so we could do a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people test with too small a... You so know, you would test with five or 10,000 pieces, yeah. and then if it worked, then you'd roll it out to the bigger list type of thing? We, we, we generally, not all the time, we'd ratchet it up. Mm. If... This is this is a concept of marketing. I don't know if I've got a product. Okay, I want to go now. I have a sort of a different definition of marketing and sales than most people do. What's that? Maybe yeah. it's there. to me, marketing and sales are separate. Yeah, they they can be intertwined sometimes, but in marketing is determining who are the people most likely to buy your product. And then how do you reach them economically? That's really Mark. You gotta determine who are most likely and how can you reach them. And if you can do that, then your your sales message. Yeah. What are you gonna say? And if it's direct marketing, the most important thing is list, uh, then it's offer, then it's copy. Yeah. Okay. So let's say we were doing a new book. Uh, we had a good seller on uh, barbecues cooking. I mean didn't do anything. Okay, so let's say we, we've got, and we've sold that book well. So we're doing another book related to that. Maybe not, you know, really. So who are most likely to buy? The people that have bought that other book. Right. The people that have bought that other book recently. Mm -hmm. People tend to buy, if there is something, they buy more than one. Now, you may go out and test those people. If it doesn't sell, and those are the most likely, and you have a list your whole house list to reach them. Well, then you got to go back and work your copy, your offer. If you can't sell those people, most likely, you, you forget it. So you work now. Once you sell them, you start working outward. You try to build your universe. The bigger you can build your universe, so you say, okay, who now beyond that is most likely? Yeah. Okay, people that have purchased similar books within the last year, maybe mm -hmm. from us. Then we go for lists list of other books that are sold. Uh, if, if we were good there, we may go out and try to um, look at people bought not bar but similar cooking books. And you what you keep doing is you expand your universe, you keep testing. You making money there? Keep going. Right. So you hit that place where you, you don't have where you're not selling anymore. Right. And maybe you have to do a little copy, but but that's yeah. so you test. You test. But you have to find the people most likely. And that's the challenge. And how do you reach them? Well, now it's easier to reach people. But, you know, if I had a product that, um, you know, was good, but I couldn't find a list. You know, I could get reach everybody if I go knock door to door. I will reach every good prospect if I go around the country and knock on every door. Right. But it's going to cost me a fortune. I can't. So it has to be economical. How do I reach them economically so I make money? Yeah. And that's, to me, the challenge of marketing. And sales, which is sometimes intertwined, is then how do you get them to buy? But if you're not, you know, if I have a great uh, adventure travel offer and I go to an, an uh, 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 old age home, I don't mean to say that in disparaging, but doesn't, I'm going to get them to pitch this great product right. with this great offer. I'm in front of the wrong audience. 
right. these people are simply not likely to buy my yeah. product. And I think people do that a lot. They, yeah. they that's why you list list first when you talk yeah, about it. Yeah, target. Because if you're talking to the wrong person, it doesn't matter what your if it's the best offer in the world. You you got to be in front of uh, the right people, and that's that's and that's the big challenge. And that's testing, testing. Don't go yeah. waste money. So yeah. he can go and immediately roll out. Generally, he'd increase it. Yeah, and see if it still helps. Yeah. So I want to go back to the time management. We talked about some of the I, board. One more thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Take it. Yeah. That's fine. Just came to mind. Yeah. And this is when I was consulting with a group. I won't mention a business, but it was fun to do it. And when you're marketing, sometimes you have to let your creative mind go. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you had a restaurant, you're trying to draw more people in. There's all kinds of advertising, but even draw people in as they walk by. What do you do? Well, let's go to the extreme. What I could do is people walk by. I could take a baseball bat and just beat the shit out of someone and then tell everyone else to go in the restaurant. I'd probably get people to go in the restaurant. Okay, that's an extreme. Take a that's shot. An that's an organized extreme. crime organized crime version. Yes. Yeah. So now I'm going to start working back from that. See, I, I go, let my mind go really out there. What's the craziest right. thing? But, right. but that will work for a while anyway. <laughs> I but thought it, you were going to say you get someone who's really strong and you just pull, physically just pull them in. Yes, and the that's another thing, yeah. Yes, yes. That will work also. Yeah. So now you start moving back from there. Instead of trying to move, you start moving, but well, cause, you know, now you say don't hit them baseball, just pull them in. And, and uh, you know, then it gets offers. Um, get a celebrity to sit in the window. All these fashion shows always have celebrities there. Mm. A lot of them are paid. It, it attracts attention, right. brings the media, you know, so people can do that in restaurants. Mm. I can tell you stuff that's sort of fun, you know, some of the PR you see that they mention restaurants and people were there and those people weren't there. They're paying for PR to get their name, and the restaurant's paying PR. So, you know, anyway. Mm. So, so, um, so you work backwards until right. you find something that works, but you allow yourself to get out there a little yeah. bit and be creative. I know I was work consulting with one company, and they did sometimes, they went to people's homes. Tough business. They had a knock on the door. Now, they, they're giving really good value, so I felt good about it, but it was very hard to do, and some people really had trouble doing it. Yeah. So I went with these people. Okay, let's work backwards. You know, um, would you feel bad knocking on the door if you're giving them $10 million? No. Right. Feel good. They'd feel good, you know? Right. So, and so we worked backwards, and we finally realized, okay, they like their great cook of, of brownies. I said, would you feel okay knocking on the door if you had a little package of brownies to give me. Say, yeah. I said, okay, there you go. Nice. I so like you that, yeah. As far as you can, right. $10 million or a shotgun or whatever, and you work backward right. to something that's doable that right. you feel good about. Yeah. And so a lot of times I like to get people to think outlandish. Yeah. Out of the go. box, creative. Yeah. Yeah. Drop a bomb on the... I shouldn't use that word. You know what I mean? But, but let your mind go. Don't censor it all. Because now we can move backwards. And when you move backwards, you think of things you never thought of before. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Go to the extreme and work backwards. Yeah. Let yourself. Yeah. And you, know, you can do that in relation. You, you can do anything that you want to make. a When you're looking for breakthrough. Yeah. Um, that brings up a question, Ken, okay. about, because obviously you do a lot of marketing consulting. What's um, some of the biggest mistakes you see people making? Okay, I mean, I, I, I think there are several. Um, one of the most frustrating is people who want consulting, but they really don't. Mm. Um, what do you mean, yeah? They want to feel like they've done it, mm. but they're not really interested in anything that they haven't thought of. They basically want someone to come in and tell them they're terrific. Mm maybe give some things that are close to what they want so they could say yes yeah, so or they've, they've used you. But um, they're really not open. They just want to validate what they're already doing. They just want to validate what they're doing. Or they're like, I remember doing a presentation once. They called me in to do a motivational presentation for these employees. And then, 
some kind of company that, that did very precise work on airplanes or something, you know. And um, so I, I came in, I met the managers, and there are, you know, about five or six main managers. I met them, and they had, I don't know, 75, 100 employees in this room. So I started working with them, and I've never worked in, some, in front of such a hostile group. Really? I mean, you know, generally, these people were absolutely hostile, hmm. nasty. And we had some, and I, I, I talked to the man, I said, what's going on? And he said, you know, um, oh, we just bought the company about three months ago, and um, we're making some changes, and these people were really hostile, so we thought maybe you could come <laughs> didn't tell me about that at all. Had no idea that that was, so that was a, that was a, uh, 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 so those kind of things, um, and you know, people could pay you money, and if they're, it's not rewarding to yeah. me, if they're really not yeah. willing to think yeah. out of the box a little. So bit. how do you do that? Do you just say, okay, why you end the call? I mean, do you try and you try yeah. to learn that, but sometimes you yeah. don't get that until you're working with people. Right. And then there's a lot of things too. It, it's sometimes sensitive. Remember, I said, how do you? Have someone like you, how you talk to someone, the tone mm. of your voice. Uh, build trust. Trust is really, how do you build trust? Consistency is a big part of it. Yeah. If you're nice to everybody, but two or three times a, a, a month, you literally lose it and scream and abuse someone. But other times you're really nice. In your mind, you go, I'm really a nice guy. To these people, they're just waiting for the bomb to fall. Mm. You know, it's like, how are you perceived? It's really important for people. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean they have to change. They may say, that's fine. So I don't yeah. want to perceive. But how you are perceived by the people who work for you. Yeah. How you're perceived by partners. Yeah. We see things through our eyes. We interpret things through our past experience and our perceptions and our beliefs. Yeah. Sometimes that's a little skewed and people need to just open up to just Moving it over a little yeah. bit. Open it up a little bit. Yeah. Give them the skills, the awareness. Yeah. I think you hit on something really important, too, with the biggest mistakes people make because most people get stuck in their ways. And so they bring yes. someone in. They just want to validate what they're already doing because Absolutely. they just want to keep doing what they're already doing. How exactly. can someone break out of that? You know, because that's, that's a really tough one, you know. And, and you as a consultant, when someone brings you in, you notice that probably right away. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a kind of, how, how do we re, I mean, how do we learn something when we're young? We learn through authority, you know, our parents, yeah. authority figures, and we could also learn through a traumatic event. We can learn really quick. Right. You know, we, we our parents told us to look both ways, or, you know, we don't listen, and then, you know, we get hit by a car, right. we we'll get hit by a car, see our listen friend really get hit quickly. by a car, right. and now you've changed your behavior. Yeah, right. So It's a so, tough one, yeah. Yeah. One of the ways people change is through someone they really respect. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid, it was Mickey Mantle. So, he's mm. the big, so you know, if, if you're having trouble at the plate and you don't believe in yourself and someone's trying to show you something, and, you know, and you're just, and all of a sudden, Mickey Mantle comes along and says, hey, I think you've got great potential, shows you something, all of a sudden you believe in yourself. Right. Because that authority figure that is able to change. Yeah, I see. I look at Tony Robbins, yeah. who does a lot of good stuff, but a lot of stuff I think that works because of the tremendous respect. He's got he such an authority. Him. Yeah, I think a lot of other people doing the same stuff, but he, and deservedly so to most extent, you know, has developed this great belief. Yeah. So I think sometimes you go in there, and if someone respects you, and this is important, a lot of people don't respect their consultants. Mm -hmm. They don't. You got to really respect someone, really, re so you really listen mm -hmm. and you really hear, and that's critical. Yeah, yeah. I could, you, yeah, and that makes sense with the authority too. You could even bring in or quote other people that are authorities on the matter or whatever the case is. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to get back to. If you know someone. What's that? If you know someone. Who's really elevated? Get them on the phone with them for five minutes. Yeah, to transfer their aura and their credibility to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I mean, do that. Yeah. Um, 
So I want to talk about the time management for a second. So we talked yes. about the the managing editor, bottom line personal, boardroom, creative targets, right. eye power, and now the time management magic. You know, you talked about writing stuff down and people carrying the notebook. It's so important remembering. And, and I heard from one of your videos saying, if it's not on the schedule, then it's not real, which which right. goes into writing down. So talk about some of your time management yes. um, uh, advice. And by the way, I know that some people don't write anymore. They have other ways yeah. to record. And I like the writing, but I'm, I'm with you. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. I for sure. Barney used to say something magical happens in the conscious and subconscious mind when that hand moves. Right. But anyway, whatever... Yeah. You know, it's like we always have this thing. Hey, we should have lunch. You know, I mean, meet somebody. Hey, we should get lunch sometime. Yeah. Yeah, let's get lunch. It's not going to happen. But if I were to say to you, hey, let's get lunch next Wednesday at one thirty, that's very likely to happen. Yeah. When you schedule something, it's ten times more likely to actually happen. And a lot right. of times what people, successful people do is they... The more successful you are, the more opportunities are going to come your way, good ones and bad. More people are going to do things with you. Yeah. The more money you're going to have to try other things. Yeah. And it can be overwhelming. And part of it is you, you've got to, two things, and I'll get to how you say no. Yeah. But, but, but the other thing, it's, it's like having a closet, a shelf on a closet. And you've got to say, where does it fit? Do I have room? Where am I going to put it? Do I have any, any really, you can right. conceptualize a, a, a shelf. Yeah. Where am I going to put that? Where's the room? There's no room. Right. You've got to think that way. You, it, and sometimes that's a metaphor, visualization. And it's very hard sometimes because someone's come in. I know Marty had this at point. You know, we were really doing well, and we had this tremendous list. And he had a lot of good people, major, you know, uh, publishers come and want to do things with him. A lot of them he couldn't do. Even Where's though they find the time? Yeah. Maybe, yes. And if they're done, probably make money. But you had to pick the best. You had to prioritize. You had to pick your best shots, most likely. Yeah. And go with them. So that now for the day, you know, that list. And I remember reading, and I'm not going to remember the name. I thought it was um, Schwab, but maybe it wasn't. But the story is... And the name of it, I can't remember anybody's name. This is going back to the twenties or something. I know I'm I'm knocking some of the cobwebs off from, from like thirty I years ago. Was, was hired by an executive to help him grow his company. And he said, "How much?" He said, I'm, "Don't I'm going to give you something. You pay me what you think it's worth." Mm, I know what you're talking about. Yes, yes. And he came up with the idea: just make a just yeah. make a list of what you're going to do the next day. And prioritize it. And actually, he wasn't prioritized. That was Alan Lakin. Um, and that did such great things for him. I mean, you know, it was such a new thought. Yeah, make a list. Um, and he gave him a huge amount of money for that. And, of course, Alan Lakin came along and he said, you make your list and you prioritize it. Now, you got to be open and flexible for things that come up. But it, it demands thinking about something mm -hmm. and really planning, a little, doing a little work on it and putting it down and then prioritize. You know, just imagine it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. What are you, you going to turn to? Mm -hmm. And I had a concept. Prioritizing is knowing what's most important and doing what's most important first. And I wanted people in the, when I spoke to understand that at an emotional level. So I'd say, okay, I want everybody to write down now 10 of the most important people in your life. Really, you know, you need to write down their children's names and their parents, you know, people that really were, they loved a lot. I said, take a look at that list, look at those names, imagine the person. So take a few minutes, okay, okay, you got that. Now I want you to imagine it's April 1912 getting close to 12 o'clock in the evening and you're on the Titanic. And that Titanic hits that iceberg. And now that boat's going down. Hmm. And you're in a lifeboat. 
and there's two seats left on that lifeboat, that's it. And every one of those 10, 15 people that mean so much to you are swimming around that freezing water. Weather. And you got about 60 seconds to make a decision which two you're going to save and which others you're going to just let die. Now it's no longer a matter of important. It's a matter of most important. Hmm. And that's the kind of way you have to look at your life. A lot of things are important. Everybody telling you what important you got to make, not every day, but you got to make that yeah. decision what is most yeah. important. And you take care of that first. And if you have time for other things, fine. Yeah. But you got to take care. They got to take care of the most important people in life. I know people that spend so much time with everyone their family, their children. What's most important? Take care of that most important. That's your job. That's yeah. your job as a business person. It's your job as a, a, a husband, a father, a right. son, whatever. Right. Yeah, I like that frame, you know, framing it in a sense of putting it in a different context that, yeah. that makes you think about that. You know, when you all you hear that story of, let's say it's, you know, be in New York in 9-11, you hear those stories and then you immediately want to go call your loved one and tell them, I love you because you're put into that context of what's most important and what should I be doing right now. And you know, the thing yeah. of making decisions, I had something they should have said that this was not a happy thing, but getting people to come to grips. Because you know, those people from 9 11, a lot of those people that were in those floors that were on fire, yeah. 85th, 86th floor, and they were by the window, they were going to die. Mm. I mean, they, you know, and which is so, you know, I'm just here at work. I mean, I have a birthday party this weekend, you know, going to dinner. I'm seeing my uncle, to, you know, it's all gone. Now they're by that window and that fire is getting closer. And they've got about one minute to make a decision. Are they going to burn to death mm. or are they going to jump 85 flights? No other decision. No other options. That's it. Make your decision right now. Never thought about it before. Never in your life thought about it. An hour before it was beyond. Now that's your life. That's your options. Burn, jump. Burn, jump. Here comes a fire. Make up your goddamn mind. Burn or jump. <laughs> you know? So we luckily are not forced to those kind of decisions. But sometimes on a different level, it is. You got you know, Pete can't make up your decision. You make up your mind. What's most important? What are you gonna do? You got to get that most important and make a decision. Yeah. You know? You were going to say something about no, saying no. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real problem for a lot of people. And again, the more successful you are, the more people come to you to want to do things, to ask you to do things with ideas and stuff like that. And it's hard to say no. Because what do most of us say? And this could be big stuff or little stuff, you know, help me at this event. You know, take on this role on this committee, whatever. So mo most of the times you want to be a good person. Yeah. I mean, so you go, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a lot of time, but yeah, I'll some, find some time to do it. I want, I want to make this person happy. I'll figure it out. Yes, I'll do it. And then you get stuck. And, you know, and you're doing it for free. And they're very appreciative. But now, if you don't do it right, they're going to be mad at you. Right. If you don't get it done, they're going to be disappointed in you. So you've got to ask the right question. The question is not, am I going to make this happy or I'll find the time somehow. You've got to understand two principles. These are earth-shaking principles. One, you can only be one place at a time. Right. I don't remember the other principle. But the question you have to ask yourself, if I choose to say yes to you, what am I choosing no to? Because right. in one place at a time, every yeah. time you say yes to one thing, you are, whether you think of it, I'm saying no to something else. Yeah. I should say yes and choose to say no to spending the time with my children. Yeah. I'm choosing to say no to working on this right. really important project. Yeah. So you really got to say, if I choose to say yes to you, am I choosing to say no to? Yeah. So you may say, if I choose to say yes to you, I'm choosing to say no to spending Saturday morning with my children. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to say no to you. Yeah. I'm not going to say no to my children. When you frame it that way, right. when you ask that question, it becomes clear. And I find that if you say no to someone firmly but nicely, right yeah. up front, we'll be, most, most people accept if they don't, you can't worry about it. Don't get into one of those traps and let me think about it. 
or maybe. Let me check. Just say no. Right. People accept. They push you. Just say, yeah. you know, I won't be able to do the, the, the job you want. But otherwise, you get inundated. Some people, their days are caught up in so many things they said they were going to do that really wasn't smart for them. Yeah. Your time is precious. Yeah. Don't anyone steal your time. One thing about stress, chronic stress, is it literally steals time and energy. Tremendous time and energy from your life. I mean, you could be, we could all be operating at such a higher level and have more time if we deal with our chronic stress yeah. besides not killing ourselves. And yeah. It does kill you. Yeah, and you know, it brings up the you know the yes or no and the opportunity cost. I remember like hearing something about Warren Buffett, and that's exactly what he thinks about when he invests. Is well, yes, this may be a great opportunity, but there's something even better that he's missing out on because he's saying yes to something else. So yes, exactly. Yeah, that's great advice. And that's um, a tough one. That's yeah. a real tough one. Yeah. So Ken, I really appreciate your time. This has been amazing, and I love your stories. Um, I always ask this. Um, Citizens Inspired Insider about um, the lowest moment and how you push forward and then the proudest moment. Mm -hmm. So what's been one of the more lower moments uh, in business um, that you had to kind of push forward through? Yeah, I, I took a left one place because I had a project that I really loved. I've been working on and it was doing well. And um, I soon realized that, you know, I thought I had the financial resources. And I really didn't. And then another opportunity came around that would give me that. And I had to make a decision. Mm. And because of family and stuff, that, that was tough to let go mm. of that one program. That was really a tough thing to do. I thought I had all the money I needed. Turned out I didn't. And, you know, that's one of the big problems with businesses is not having the finances. How did you, you know, obviously it's a tough decision. How did you come to what was right for you? Well, you know, that was a time that I now had something new to balance, which was my family. I mean, the opportunity came on as a great one, which I really loved and yeah. led to great things. But, you know... Um, it was, I, I, I think that part of it was dealing with my ego. Hmm. Um, that was a difficult, I'll tell you another difficult time was someone I'd worked with for 20 some years and leaving that situation because of some tension. That was a really tough, that was another, it happened around the same time. Hmm. And that was a real tough one. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's something, you know, I remember a friend of mine who had a great partnership with he said, you know, partnerships never work. They'll work for a while, they'll never work. Right. And this guy after twenty five years, they disintegrated in a very, you know, uh contesting yeah. uh, kind of split. But that was tough. Those yeah. things were tough. Yeah. Twenty five years is a long time though. Like Yeah. In a good yeah. way. You yeah, know. Well, they, they had a great run. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's uh I ask because if someone's hard. you know that's going to do it, it's yeah. just I ask because if someone's going through it now, you know, whatever that is, which is, you know, whether it's financial or business or partnership, uh, what advice do you have for them? Well, I mean, you know, if, <laughs> if you listen to anyone who's been successful or most people, they will tell you that there were people that said it won't work mm -hmm. and they pushed in and they did it. Mm hmm that's a tough call. Are you one of those people or not? You have to make a decision. Because for every one of those people, there are 10 that just, you know, push and push and push and, you know, uh, did not work. And, of course, a lot depends. If You know, the one thing, if you're young, go for it, you know. Um, it's harder when you're older and you have a lot of responsibilities. But part of it, you know, you got to believe in yourself. Uh, you got to really have something you believe in. you got to believe in yourself. And um, more than other people are going to believe in you sometimes. Yeah, I know when Marty started, Marty had a great job and he got that idea and he started out of his basement with his wife and his kids, his young yeah. kids then. Yeah. And no one thought it would work. So he had that belief in himself. He had that belief. But, 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 he got it tested. Yeah. As soon as he could, he got out there and he got something out in the market. <laughs> it was good and tested it. 
It just didn't stay in his head. Then as it get as you can, success knowledge. People that have actually done it. Hmm. Jim um oh, gives with a C, the guy that started um Career Track. When we decided to do a seminar, I got access to him and I was on the phone with him and he laid out a blueprint for me. This is how you do it. I mean, he knew. <laughs> he so many He's done it before. Like, he said, here, I'll take you through it. Yeah. I mean, how much time and money did that save us? This was a guy who was super successful. He knew how to do it. Yeah. And he told me how he did it. Didn't mean it was a perfect roadmap for us, but my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, success knowledge. Yeah. Success knowledge. You don't have to believe and take everything they say is true. But if they if they do not line up with you, you got to look, well, how is mine different? Right. What am I doing yeah. different? You know, anyway. That's why I love this in talking to you and then talking to the other founders I have on because we're learning from people who have actually done it. And yeah. um, it's really powerful. So on the flip side, Ken, what about one of the proudest moments business-wise for you? Oh, I mean, because my proudest moments are personal. Yeah. I mean, my proudest moments, my, I mean, by far are my um, wife and daughter and my doggies and my cat. I mean, yeah. I, it's just... I know okay. you're a family man, yes. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I had some um, law school, uh, being able to teach at the graduate college that was, was a thing. Uh, when I came out of law school, I didn't want to practice law, so I went and got involved with a, a, a business and I was making a lot of money. Being, so I, I uh, invented some stuff. You have a couple patents, I read. Yeah. And it's interesting, it was an exercise device. Really? I got the idea at night, I woke up, and then it was interesting pushing it through, you know, because I, I went and had a model made at a, uh, at a place, and I went, at that time, you didn't have the internet, so I located about 10, 15 companies I thought would be interested, and I sent out letters, and I visited, made presentations. Um, and uh, I forget the name of the company, AMC. It was a big sports company, but it, it, it didn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. But it was one of the big ones then. And I remember I went to a meeting over in Jersey somewhere, some marketing guy. Yeah. And I had put the, the device, because it was real little, in this leather case. And um, and I had gone to the, uh, the phys ed department director at Conner College and had him run a test. And so he gave me a testimony. The product worked. And I had models do all the extra Anyway, so I go there, I put it there, and I'm telling him about this product. And I'm telling him about other products in the market that are similar and why they work and why those don't, I think. And then I wanted to show him the product. But I wanted him to sign something. I had my lawyer give me, you know, I don't want to show him something, they go and use it. And, of course, he didn't want to sign something. He had something for me to sign. Because he didn't want me to say I showed up at this thing and they're working on a product and now I, you know, if they're playing. So, so we're at this impasse. And luckily, there was a senior person from California that was at the meeting, and he was just sitting there watching. And I had this beauty, and he said, oh, the hell with it. I mean, he literally said that he took, put his name on it. So I showed him the product. <laughs> if you and, want to see what's in this leather bag, you will sign your name. Yeah, but I think I'd give him a good presentation. Yeah. And uh, they bought it, and I got a royalty. Not a lot of money, but I, it enabled me to live a couple years not worrying about money. Yeah. Um, and but the interesting it was called they named the Bruce Jenner PMJ3 product. So on the box it was Bruce, Bruce Jenner using it. <laughs> so you know, and Bruce Jenner has come back. If I, you know. Yes, I've... I still have a few of them around. Do you? All right. <laughs> but but I that was fun. It wasn't a big deal, but I, I needed the money, and it was it was yeah. cool to do that. Hey, Just that, that's have, cool. yeah. You have a vision of something in your mind, and you just make it happen. Yeah. That was fun. I love that. Anything else you could think of? Proud moments? Well, milestones? I love the seminars. I love the speaking. And we affected a lot of people, and I had a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, figuring out how to really move people, how to really bring about that internal change was important. Yeah. I've worked with some great clients. Yeah. Um, and really done some good work, and that's always rewarding. Yeah. You know, when you do consulting, 
you work very close to the money flow. I mean, some people work in this department, that department, that department. You're real close to the money coming. In. So you can make a big difference. Yeah. Um, you know, and then working with some executives and helping them see how to, you know, work with the people and be more productive. Yeah. yeah. And relax. <laughs> so, Ken, uh, this has been amazing. And I want, I have one last question for you. Sure. Uh, before I ask it, where should we point people towards? Where should they check out? I know um, KenGlickman.com. People can find that out the information. Just being really, it's going to be totally redone. Okay. So I really think. Where should we send I people? Like phone call if it's for, if it's a serious phone call. Yeah. Um, I don't mind giving a face. I mean, if someone's, yeah. uh, and I I will connect. Yeah. If I don't feel, then I will not. Yeah. Connect back. So if you if you what call about me, an email instead? I don't want pe random yeah, people calling you. But actually. This shows you how old I am. Yeah. As much as I use email, my mind doesn't go yeah. to email. Phone is great, yeah. It's, I mean, a, it's a lost art of calling someone. The about the consulting thing yeah. is how rapidly things have changed. I mean, my gosh. And the things I've had to learn, you know, just stay current. Just the different marketing opportunities uh, are amazing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that being said, Ken underscore Glickman at this point, msn.com. That's why I'm better than the phone. Ken underscore Glickman at msn.com. Yeah. Send me an email. Give me a little information about. Only if it's serious, obviously. I, I mean, again, if, I'm if a, you want to find out more information, they can go to your site. There's videos, there's other things on there that. I don't mind. That doesn't yeah. mean you have to be spending money. Yeah. But you, you know. You're very generous, yeah. So, Ken, my last question. Yes. You know, we, we've talked about big lessons from Marty. We've talked about big lessons from Joe Polish. Um, and I guess that one of the great men in my life was a gentleman named uh, Kaicho Dadashi Nakamura, uh, who is a brilliant guy and just an amazing human being. Hmm. And I learned tremendous, tremendous amount from him. I'll look uh, that up. And yeah. the big lessons from Marion Adler uh, as well. And I, I think there's always behind that. What's up, now? She's been retired. Like she did so well. I think she retired at fifty. Well, and I mean, we'll have to get her on here. Um, yeah, I, and great person to talk to. You know, behind yeah. the successful man, there's a more successful woman. So, and powerful woman. So, I want to know the biggest lessons you learned from your wife, actually, because I know you're a big family man. Well, you know, my wife is an amazing human being. Brilliant. Um, she, she has. She was a lawyer background too, right? She's a graduate of Columbia Law School, which yeah. is the top law school in the country. Yeah. A Harlan Stone Scholar. Um, she was a partner in a law firm in New York, and she then uh, she retired for a little while to be with my daughter, and then she didn't want to practice law after that because too consuming. She went and did great work in legal recruiting. And she's now a dean at Hofstra Law School. Hmm. And uh, just a wonderful person. Yeah. I, I think one of the great things, you know, sometimes um, over, we've known each other 32 years, I think. You know, over that time, sometimes you get disappointed and, you, you know, she always never, ever wavered in her total commitment to the relationship. Mm -hmm. We could be having a really bad time that's why I tell some people that, that are having trouble. They're not sure if they should get married. Particularly guys. Guys reach a certain age. They could just have a hard time making a commitment when mm -hmm. they should. I say, you know something? Things change when you get married. You take away that option. Right. Because sometimes when you go, oh, they did this. I don't know if I could live with this for life. And they say, you know, you know this is a good, the right purpose. You know, I say, it just takes that off the table. Right. You know what? You got a little problem there. You got to work it out. Mm -hmm. You got to work it out. I mean, it's yeah. not. You know, it's it, it, you found someone really good. You found someone really good. Now make the commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's got to be a really strong commitment. Mm -hmm. You can't go to some of these options that people go to too, too yeah. easy. And I'm not saying people that are in abusive relationships are thinking ought to get out. Right. Right. But, you know, not all circumstances, but yes. So you've learned unwavering commitment from her. What uh, else? Yeah. Yeah. 
an unwavering commitment. I think another thing that Daphne's really good at is doing something right away. Mm. Don't, I mean, the little things, you know? Yeah. You got to send in that form. You got to do this with your taxes. Yes. Do it right now. Yeah, I laugh because I'm horrible at that. <laughs> yes. She gets me. She says, uh, she gives me, says, okay, I'll take care of that. She keeps it in check. Yeah. I said, I don't do that. She said, do it now. She right. always gets things done right away. She saves herself so much trouble. And, boy, people depend on her. Yeah. I mean, she says no, she says no, but, it, boy, she says she's going to do something. Boy, you, it's like having money in the bank. She just does it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's something else. Uh, I'll tell you one other thing. This may seem a little strange to people. Daphne was a big dog person. Mm -hmm. I had a dog for a long time. I, I, to me, a dog was a dog. And I got involved. She had her Barney, beautiful dog, when we met that came and lived with us. And I had fun with Barney, but I never, I never really understood. And a big lesson, well, you know, a dog... You want to do something, and not doing it. And the big thing about a dog is all they want to do is please you. All they want, it's communication. It's all in the communication. And that was a big lesson for me, for people too. It's the communication, it's how you communicate. That was a simpler form, but all, you, you got someone there, this wonderful soul, and all they want to do is please you. Yeah. And you're having trouble with it. Why? It's you. It's not them, it's you. What are you going to do to make it better? I mean, that gets back to the same thing. What's wrong with it? It's their fault and their fault and their fault. Even if it is their fault. You know, I tell people, if, if, if you're in a situation, you got a tyrant of a boss, it's really making you miserable, and for some reason you can't leave right now until you, you get something because you have fun. Okay, what are you going to do to make it better? What are you going to do so it doesn't bother you so much? Right. I mean, it doesn't mean it's fair. Right. Life could be unfair, but it's still. What are you going to do about it? What are you going? That's where you. That's where you have the ultimate power. The ultimate power. Yeah. And if you get to, I'm not going to remember the name again. It's great. <laughs> that's so terrible. This is a really famous book that I read when I was like 20 and read about four times in between. But that concept, the ultimate power you have in your life, is how you choose to react to something. Yeah. Nobody can. Take that away from you. And this was a gentleman who was in the concentration camps. And mm, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, it's one of my favorite books also. Now I can't remember the name of it. It's, um, um, yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. And he's a psychologist, right? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, that was a big It's like as soon as we want it recalled, like it doesn't come. But, um, but I, if it's late and you missed the train, and I say, why are you upset? I'm upset because I missed the train. Well, you're upset because you chose. You know, there's, there's, a, cho there's a stimulus response, but right in between is the choice. That's the moment. And that's about the attitude you adopt in life. And you know, in business, you're going to have disappointments. I mean, you are going to have disappointments. Things aren't going to, you got disappointments in people. That could actually waylay you. It can make it miserable, even if you're successful. Yeah. So you're it's Victor Frankel, Man's Search for Meeting. Victor Frankel, Man's Search for Meeting. Yeah. And now I just have to remember that other gentleman's yeah. name. Well, <laughs> Ryan Brian would throw a grapefruit at me or something. I'm going to send this to him. I, He's good. Yeah. It's all the good. But... Stuff. You know, Ken, I really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Everyone should check out KenGlickman.com. You have some great videos on YouTube. And, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I've done a lot of interviews. I think this is maybe the best. You, well, you really got me going, made me feel comfortable. You showed enthusiasm. You're really great. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate you to be back. Be well, sir. Between my eyes, walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand, and right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand.